Hi, uh, my name is Ani. I'm from the US. I'm based in Hong Kong. Um, I'm part of Mobilization Lab. We go by Mob Lab for short. And we're a collective of global campaigners, trainers, um, media strategists, communications people. Uh, my background is in feminist journalism, grassroots feminist organizing in kind of the South American and Asian contexts. So I've worked as a reporter, I've worked together with grassroots collectives, um, fundraising, doing mutual aid, uh, doing campaigns together. And yeah, today we're going to be going through a workshop on how to build a campaign from scratch. And it is in a very condensed format. So this is quite different than what we typically do at Mob Lab. We typically do longer campaign trainings. They're called the campaign accelerator. Um, a lot of these like different elements of the campaign accelerator are open source, free to use, open to the public exercises that you can find on our website. Um, and we run these trainings for global advocacy organizations. Um, we do public trainings. And yeah, this is uh, how to build a campaign. Tony, did you want to say something about 350's Global Trainings Week? Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm the Asia Digital Manager. From 250, I'm based in Jakarta, Indonesia, and this Global Training Week is a series of training that has been done by 350 training team. And we would like to invite people coming from our network to join this Global Training. There will be more training in the webinar style happening later on, so you can watch the recording later in our training website. So please enjoy this screening and yeah, Wait, there's someone. All right. I would like to invite these uh, people here. Uh, Claire, maybe is, is that okay with you, Annie, as well? Of course. Go for it. Sure. Okay. I'm good. Like to admit this person. Hey, Claire, uh, this is Tony. I'm the tech support for this session. And apparently you are the, uh, the only participant for this session, but we would like to try out a new kind of things. And Annie is with us now. Uh, and we would like to try out to how to make this session into a, a resource a content for our um, activities. So over to you, Annie. Yeah. Hi, Claire. Uh, just to introduce myself briefly. Uh, my name is Ani. I'm from the US. I'm based in Hong Kong. I'm part of Mob Lab, uh, Mobilization Lab. We grew out of a innovation project at Greenpeace and fully fledged into our own organization today, which we run as a collective of trainers and campaigners from around the world. Um, yeah, I go by she, her. My background is in feminist advocacy, sort of grassroots movements. Um, I also work as a freelance journalist. So I'm really focusing on communications and media strategy. And yes, yeah, so we have a little bit of a small turnout for this session, but that's fine because we can run it more as a conversation between us. Um, and also 350 is recording this session, if that's okay with you, and, and it can be a resource for their network um, to live on their website and yeah, for anyone to access this. So if you wanna introduce yourself, go ahead. If you don't, it's okay as well. Yeah, nice to meet you guys. I was not expecting to be the only one. <laughs> um, I have to I have to do a task tonight, so I don't know that I'm 
I, I didn't plan on staying for the full session anyway. That's fine. Sorry, guys. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my name's Claire. I actually I actually work for Greenpeace Annie. Um, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in the digital and fundraising departments. And I just have an interest in, I guess, some of the sort of the, the bare bones lines um, of how of how 350C is like campaigning strategy. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what what I saw in the in the schedule, and I was interested. So yeah, so I'm here. I also run um, I run this sort of side project in addition to working at Greenpeace, where we mm -hmm. send. Uh, and accompany youth from Montreal to COP events. Um, last mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. we went to Glasgow for COP26. This year, mm -hmm. we're gonna be doing some work, some campaign work um, and lead up to COP15 in Montreal for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's a little bit about me and why I'm joining. Um, okay, yeah. great. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. And no worries, uh, if you need to turn off your camera or do a task, feel free to be comfortable and listen and participate as much as you want or need to. Um, this, this workshop is going to be more from Mob Lab's perspective of campaigning strategy. So it's, it is aligned with 350 in what we consider as like people powered um, campaigning strategy. And I think we're both organizations focused on, um, you know, people powered systems change. So those are sort of like the two main ingredients of our campaigning strategy. Yeah. Uh, just wanted <laughs> to make that clear because 350 has been inviting different um, asking their staff to run trainings and do conversations, but also inviting, um, yeah, lots of grassroots folks or folks from other organizations. So I think it's a mixed bag um, from what I've seen. Yeah. Amazing. I just joined uh, the Mob Lab Slack channel. Like I just, just joined it. So I'm so mm -hmm. excited to hear, to hear all about that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, I'll get started. Yeah. So we are just doing a condensed format today. I think it's now going to be roughly Sorry, an hour. Annie, oh, go ahead, Tony. The, the screen is still on the uh, I mu Apple Music. Oh, let's go ahead. Cheers. Are you guys Better? Um, in Southeast Asia right now? Tony is in Indonesia right now, right? Right, correct, yes. I'm in Hong Kong right now. So that's where we're both based. Um, yeah, this is, just, this is just a short presentation that we came up for this very condensed workshop format. We're typically running um, five day long campaign accelerators sometimes condensing them into two full days for organizations. Um, but we're trying to develop shorter formats and to make these trainings more accessible to like a wider audience. So we just thought this was a great opportunity from 350 to, and, and we've, had, we've had invites from other organizations as well to develop these like two hour formats. Um, so it's, it's just something that I'm, I'm really happy to be sharing. Hopefully it can still be useful and as interesting, although not as much of a deep dive into like certain exercises. Um, yeah, so just outcomes, we're just gonna be thinking about some of the key elements um, of a people power campaign. Um, thinking we're gonna, I'm gonna show some examples and especially I think it's a great time to be thinking about storytelling, the short amount of time that we have, it's just, probably the most, uh, one of the most important strategies in your campaign. Um, yeah, so this is meant to be a question for everyone participating in the workshop. Um, 
now it can be more of a conversation between the three of us. But I just wanted to ask, what are the best elements of a successful campaign that you've seen? Um, I can I can go first if it helps. I think I really remember campaigns that um, have used like really creative narrative strategies. And by that, I mean, um, they take a narrative that already exists and a narrative is just something, some almost like a preconception that people have about something like a commonly told story can turn into a narrative. They take like this pre-existing story or stereotype and then they flip it. Um, so it can be things like uh, really funny wordplay or just, yeah, just flipping a stereotype and doing it in a really creative way, like either using irony or humor or um, flat out just like wordplay. I can't think of like a specific example of this right now, but every time I see it, I'm really impressed. A, a lot of these things are kind of dependent on language. So like, it's also using humor, like for example, humor in Brazil or a wordplay in French, as opposed to wordplay in English. Um, and I, I'm always really struck by, by these campaigns. Um, Tony, do you have, have you, yes. do you for, think of for, any successful campaigns? <laughs> yeah, for me, the, the key of, uh, ingredients of the um, successful campaign would be, first, it has to be inspired people. Um, so, mm -hmm how to inspire maybe because of the people because of the stories that behind it and maybe mm -hmm. because of the 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 closeness of 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 those issues to us to to target so it has the story it has the kind of closeness uh, uh, part and i think there are some uh, the third one will be on it needs to be able to move people so yeah for me those are the at least three main uh, feature of the successful campaign. Wow, okay, three things. That's great, thanks, Tony. Um, Claire, does anything yeah. come to mind? Yeah, I'm just thinking like, what my favorite ones have ever been, but um, ones that I guess just come to mind right away are, um, I don't know how many of you guys have experienced in Canada, but um, there was like maybe 10 years ago, there was this Greenpeace, just like parody video, similar to what you guys mm -hmm. are saying, like talking mm -hmm. about humor and storytelling. Like in this case, it was like this spoof video of the then prime minister, he's a conservative, Stephen Harper, um, you know, having this like conversation with his staff saying, you know, we're going to invest like like millions and millions into advertising how good fossil fuels are for the rest of Canada and mm -hmm. how that absolutely needed advertising dollars and it was a good investment. Um, anyways, it, it can be looked up on YouTube, but I just remember finding it so funny. The actors, <laughs> it was like a two minute video with like great actors. And <laughs> it just, sometimes you need that little push um, and like a little bit of humor to find yourself laughing and then finding yourself in agreement with like what the line is, what what the position is of the, the campaign. So yeah, I just, that's something I've always liked about orgs like Greenpeace, but also like a whole bunch of others that do spoofs. Um, and it's a way to sort of like make that content carry itself, um, you know, and, and heightens the chances that the content will like, you know, be seen by more and more people. and. So I don't know if that's like as much of a campaign strategy as much as like a comm strategy. Maybe sometimes they're not so dissimilar. Yeah. I think they're very, I think they're very similar, you know, and yeah. I say that coming from a communications background and mm -hmm. working as part of a campaigning strategy, campaign training collective. Uh, I, I think communications is, you know, almost number one together with the message. 
yeah, so I think I think both of you talked about that. You talked about um, these are ultimately communication strategies, but the the message, the core of the campaign itself has to also be, you know, worthy of those communication strategies. It has to be um, they have they have it has to be a campaign idea that ultimately like touches and inspires people. And without that, we can't develop these communication strategies around it, right? That could be funny or, you know, provoking outrage or humor or, you know, uh, engagement, depending on what you want. So I think both of you mentioned really great examples. Um, yeah, it has to be inspiring issues close to people. Um, you know, I talked about wordplay and narrative flips, and uh, you talked about like satire and irony, and maybe using like an unconventional, an unconventional campaigning strategy, which might be humor. Some people might see that as unconventional. Yeah. So I'm going to give some examples here of, of things that we've seen in successful campaigns, it's just to take note of. Um, there's a lot of them, obviously, I can just read some of them out. Um, but really, some that stick out for me are is storytelling. It's just not just the content. We, we, just, we just can't be conveying information to people. A, a successful campaign is not just going to convey information because on a daily basis, everyone is conveying information to people. We have information being thrown at us from all angles. So it's a campaigning is going to be taking, you know, a step above just conveying information, but really about the objectives and the strategy, um, the strategies around it and, and telling stories that touch people. Um, another key one that I want to point out is, is collaboration. Um, you know, at Mob Lab, we're talking about people powered campaigns. And although we can design strategies to maximize the amount of engagement and uh, participation that you can reach outwardly with your campaign, if you don't have collaboration from the campaign designing stage with external organizations and collectives and networks, then I don't see how it, it can be so people powered. It has to be a people powered campaign from its design, which means that you're going to be basically already community organizing at the step at the step of designing your campaign, trying to reach out to um, ally organizations, ally collectives, um, grassroots communities, getting feedback from them, designing the campaign with them. Um, so there has to be, there has to be a lot of collaboration. And we see that the most successful campaigns, um, they will never be like the brainchild of just one organization. They typically, although, although, although we see them as products of just one or two organizations, um, for example, when I read about the story of Strike Debt, which is a US-based organization um, organizing to eradicate debt, like student medical housing debt in the US, um, if you pull into their story, they are never, 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 never working on their own. They're never designing anything on their own. Um, they're in constant collaboration with so many other orgs. They pull from them, they share resources. Um, yeah, but people know strike debt more, but it's, it's just not only their work. Um, yeah, we like some, some things here. Rational facts and figures are important, but it's important to reach people on an emotional level. Um, yeah, campaigns can continue but beyond their lifetime is another one I want to emphasize. Um, sometimes we think of campaigns as like end products, but actually the entire campaigning process can be some form of community organizing, like I already mentioned, 
the, pr the process of developing the campaign itself can be part of the work, which is ultimately to build collective power, um, you know, to change narratives, to change stories, to reach your objectives, but you can reach your objectives after your campaign has ended many, many years ago um, and, and, and not fail. You, you might not fail just because you haven't achieved those objectives by the end of your campaign. Um, we see this more as a you know, continued process and a power building process. And yeah, there's a lot here. Um, the slides will be available after this so you can sort of run through them and we're going to go more into steps so um, so these are some concrete steps just condensing the sort of bare bones process of building your campaign strategy and um, i i like to say campaign strategy because ultimately that's going to be difference between um, just launching a campaign out there and really thinking about a people-powered systems change campaign. There needs to be more of an involved process for doing a campaign that is ultimately going to have a, a longer and wider effect than just the campaign timeline. Um, you know, these days we can all build campaigns. We all, uh, many of us who have access to internet, we have the tools to build campaigns. People who don't have access to the internet, they also have different tools to build campaigns um, in their immediate communities through different political processes as well. Um, so we have digital tools, we have offline tools, but ultimately today we're talking about campaign strategy, how to do it in a way that is going to um, really build collective power um, and really think about you know, systems change. So in this training, we're not able to do as much of the systems change exercises that Mob Lab we would normally do when we run these trainings for organizations. Um, a lot of systems change activities are it's really it's really about looking at the whole ecosystem of actors. So all of the um, all of the people who are affected by this issue, all of the actors who are affecting the issue, mapping out potential allies, current allies, um, mapping out yeah different actors and agents who can help. And and as you do the activities, they can just get more involved. And it's actually really fascinating and super interesting that there are many ecosystems around the world for everything. Today, we're just gonna focus on the problem, the goal, engagement, um, you know, tactics, and especially storytelling. Um, this, is a, this is going to be just showing some examples um, of the five steps. Um, identifying the problem. There is a, there is a Greenpeace um, campaign again around a oil tanker that was uh, going to be dumped off of the coast of Norway. And so Greenpeace was campaigning to not dump this oil tanker. Um, at, it, this was like many years ago, so there were a lot of other things going on and they were just campaigning against like uh, any nuclear waste in general, um, oil tankers not being dumped. Uh, they named the campaign something Battle of the Brent Star. Does this ring a bell for you, Claire? No? Uh, I think there were, you know, a lot of great campaigns. It's hard to <laughs> choose amongst them. Um, yeah, so this was, there are some just like concrete things to be taken out here. What is the problem? The problem is, you know, waste being dumped in Northeast Atlantic, um, identifying like the concrete goal of the campaign 
if there isn't a, typically I find that the goal is negative for many campaigns that we do. It could also be like an interesting exercise in the future to think about positive goals. Um, but in for the majority of the campaigns that we see, and especially I would say like the easiest goals to typically identify, they typically end up being negative. And what I mean when I say negative, I mean that they are typically an action to stop or to pull a bill or to block something to prevent as a negative force action. Um, it, it could be an interesting exercise for organizations and, and um, you know, grassroots groups regional groups as well to think about positive force goals, as in to build something, to create funding for this, to, um, to you know, build this community center to get, you know, these are the examples that I'm coming up with now, uh, but it's just something that I notice consistently across campaigns. Um, they had their sort of target groups like very clearly identified um yeah environmentalists and also people concerned about the oceans um and then tactics are sort of the building blocks of your strategy you have a sort of overall campaign strategy as in um where you're going to run your campaign who are you running it with um over you know what time what what are the sort of the overarching like goals and vision of a campaign strategy, but then tactics are like the daily tasks every day. And, and there can also be really creative. We do a lot of like creative tactics, brainstorming sessions where you can think of tactics really quickly and using sort of almost randomized processes like association exercises, um, creativity brain flow exercises and so the amount of tactics that you can use can sort of be endless here they had some um, I would say like quite traditional tactics associated with uh, campaigning this campaign was also I think like 10 years ago uh, policy paper advocacy legal objection advocacy this is uh, also kind of being known as like um, strategic litigation today. Um, it's working in some context for some issues like quite well, but not everyone can participate in strategic litigation. So it's something to notice. Uh, occupation, uh, just quite a direct action, boycott. And um, yeah, and the story of the campaign, which I would say is like the most, important thing um we tried to tell the official channels they didn't listen they're ruining our oceans and forcing us um, to put our lives at risk now they're attacking us boycott shall and join us and nobly standing up to these bullies who are hurting all of us um you know this the story can be compelling for different reasons but it is typically appealing to emotions it's appealing to um, yeah, things that are close to people and also like directly inspiring action. I think we're going to be focusing on how can you create stories that are not just inspiring, not, not just like focusing on, on pity or anger or frustration, but also there is a compelling ask in it. So we are telling a story, but not to a passive audience. We're telling a story to make this audience like active and engaged and inspire them to do something. There is an emotional appeal, but then there is also like a specific action and, and in, in open invitation in the story. Do you have any questions so far or anything you wanted to share? Tony or Claire? <laughs> no, all good. I'm good, I'm um, good. I'm, I think I'm, um, 
I'm good. I'm just thinking. No, I think I'm good. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just like. Are you it. sure? No, I'm. I, you I can ask the like... question unformulated. It's okay. Thank you. I um, I'll just like this. It doesn't have anything to do with this example, but I'm just trying to. I'm surprised at how clear the distinction is between goals and tactics are for me here. Like here in this case, I can clearly see the difference, but I mm -hmm. have gotten into problems where like, um, some, like I've been told that like too many times I've like made this mistake between like goals and tactics. So um, part of me thinks it's a little bit, <laughs> I don't know, it's a little bit, I don't know. Part of me thinks it's a little bit, um, it's always gonna be a little bit blurry. But yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm hoping to, in the next couple of examples, to sort of get more of a sense of like, ah, I, I want to have that ah moment where I'm like, oh, that's like the easy way to distinguish between them. Anyways, yeah, I, I get that like, interesting. I get that like, like the, um, the tactics are to accomplish the goal. But mm -hmm. yeah, I guess sometimes it's like not. Anyways, sorry, go on. <laughs> this that's, is my own person. I think that's a good. <laughs> I think that's a perspective from somebody who is, you know, really working in especially tactics. That's sort of my reading of what you're saying. Um, because I think of the tactics as the day-to-day uh, -day tasks of carrying out a campaign and like as being part of the campaign strategy, I think it's really easy to get lost in the tactics. Um, and, you know, I, I talk about them as if they're small, but it's, this is really like all encompassing work. When you're in the tactics, it is your whole life. You know, there are, there can be, depending on how big a campaign is, depending on how many, um, you know, resources there are for it, as in like people, how distributed it is, how many different tactics are, there can be entirely different teams for each, you know, for each tactic, and they can take a very long time to do. And, and so I think that it's very understandable to, um, yeah, to just to just think in that to be like, caught up in that. Um, I guess, the way that I think of the goals as being positive or negative force. That's something that I do personally. Um, everyone has their own reading of campaign goals. But the reason why I think about that is because um, I think a lot about like hope-based narrative, especially for campaigners, but also for all human rights people. And I think that when we are designing campaigns with negative force goals, they are very easy to understand. It makes something seem achievable to people. I understand the importance of designing these campaigns. We actually do have to stop a lot of um, very harmful things happening. So I completely understand it. At the same time, I'm someone who believes that we need to be designing um, campaigns with more positive force goals, not because, not because I think there needs to be this, you know, balance of negative versus positive, but because I think we need to build, you know, we need to build um, infrastructure for us. It can't just be all the time about stopping this bill or stopping the harmful effects we need to be proposing alternatives. Um, there's a lot of people talking about this right now in the, in the human rights space. Um, it, it's quite difficult to do, and there are many reasons for that. It's difficult to imagine like, um, you know, more funding for radical work. It's difficult to imagine having access to land or access to, you know, that's why I like, I like all of these organizations working on like sort of community land trusts, um, community banks, uh, cooperatives, um, mutual aid collectives, thinking about, you know, funding in very community driven ways. We, so there, uh, you, you can kind of look, you can kind of identify a campaign goal by just thinking, you know, what is, 
what are we trying to do? Is it to, is it to stop something or is it to create something? And that would be a very clear distinction between the campaigns. And I, I kind of do that on a personal basis when I'm, when I'm going through campaigns, this is what I'm looking for. And, you know, sometimes campaigns are also about fundraising, which I'm sure you know, and this, this is very specifically a, um, like a positive ask for me. And so it is about ask, inviting people to participate in a way and to engage in a way um, and making an emotional ask for them to participate and engage, but also to imagine, you know, this alternative, this more hopeful, positive alternative that we could have and we need the resources and we need the funding for it. So fundraising for me can also be, you know, tied to campaigning. It is tied sometimes. Um, not all the time, and it can be a positive ask, and there are all other kind of like positive goals as well. But I think that's a example that you would you would know a lot about. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're gonna get a little bit more the goal and strategy here. Um, some of this I've kind of gone over, but just just as we did with that example. Um, of the Greenpeace campaign, we're gonna think about, you know, everything in metaphors. So, you know, the problem that we are trying to tackle, just imagine that you are a person on a road, you kind of need to get somewhere. Uh, the road is not straight and you don't have a car or a bicycle. You, you don't have much really. So the problem is probably you just, trying to figure out where you want to go, I think as well. I think that's actually a great metaphor for most organizations is they think that they need to get down to the end of the road. And I would say, well, the problem is where do you want to go? Actually, it's not just what, where you think that you have to go. It's where do you want to go, you know? Um, and the problems could be also like the obstacles along the way. So yeah, the strategy is the route that you take um, and the tactics are the actions to implement your strategy. So for example, you can see in this, in this image, which is of a, a person on a curving road, there are mountains, there are sort of desert uh, flora and fauna. Um, there's a river, you know, and the tactics could be um, the ways that they cross this land or river and ocean and to get to their goal. And they could, um, you know, they could walk, they could run, they could hike, they could somehow fashion a boat and go down the river. They could live off of the flora and fauna for a while to, uh, hydrate and nourish themselves as they go very slowly and approach their goal. They could go around the mountains, they could go over the mountains. Maybe they could build a para, paraglider, I think. So you go up the mountains, then you have a paraglider. Then instead of walking the rest of your way, you just launch off on the paraglider. And if you've ever been in one, it's, it's actually very anticlimactic climactic, very easy. It's like so easy that it's not exciting anymore. And then you just travel this long distance and you float down. Um, yeah, and the goal is where you want to go. And I, I would propose, like I said before, that one of the problems is figuring out what your goal is. So I would, I would propose that to a lot of organizations because they have the goals, you know, sort of clearly defined in the beginning of their campaign. But in our campaign design strategy, we we uh, we recommend at every step of the campaign design process to ask for feedback uh, from your partners, from your allies, from your target groups to constantly reevaluate, 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 reevaluate your goals.
um, I think this quote is a pretty interesting one um, because it also implements this, um, you know, power lens. Uh, and we, we want to be talking more about power and anti-oppression in our campaign design trainings, especially if we're going to be talking about uh, people power campaigns. We need to be talking about what does that mean? What does collective power mean versus um, the way that power currently operates in our world and you know, individuals with disproportionate amounts of power also creating collective power together as well. So what does the type of power that we want to build based on anti-oppression, what does that mean? Why do we need that to achieve the change that we want to make? So can kind of uh, summarize our, our, our strategy in this sentence, turning what you have, all, all the resources that you have available to you through um, your own organization, through your own personal network, through your wider networks, through your organizational networks, all of the resources that you have to do that includes, um, includes money, people, time, technology, um, languages, food, art, you know, so many different types of resources that we have available to us into what you need, building collective power, people powered in, you know, in this, in our campaign approach to get what you want, right? Which is a change in this situation, which is, uh, which is changing the problem. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, um, what are all of the different ways that we can think about resources? I, I'm actually curious if, um, yeah, if either of you can think of some resources, you know, that are not just, just think of them out loud. They don't, they can be on this slide or they don't have to be on this slide. Start. I would say expertise. Like mm -hmm. I remember we did this like whole like we paid up some consultants a lot of money to um <laughs> to sort of give us sort of like a, an evaluation of what we call our supporter journey. And mm -hmm. um one of the ways that we really wanted to improve was to like make use of and sort of like harness like the expertise of a lot of our supporters because a lot of them want to contribute more than just money more than just like let's say to a direct action like they're not the kind that like a professor is not necessarily often the kind of person who wants to go climb a building you know and hang a big sign mm -hmm. <laughs> like they might be mm -hmm. the kind who like has been studying this for years and wants to sort of maybe advise on a policy paper so um i think a lot of orgs that I'll speak for Greenpeace, like we can make things easier for people like that to sort of contribute in that way because it's mm -hmm. really valuable. And like, you know, people who work for like salaried employees or whatever don't have, we can't be expected to have like all the expertise on like a given subject. Um, of course. And the, you know, we can benefit from each other's, you know, there's so many ways we can benefit from like having allies in the right places. So. That's Tony, do you have thought. any? Yeah, that's great. That's a great one. Thank you. Right. Tony, do you have any so ideas? Yes, I'm thinking about uh, when we are going to change supporters into collaborators or allies. Mm -hmm. It seems to be mm -hmm. all the same, but we didn't have those kind of um, um, uh, control of our collaborators. I mean, like they have, sometimes they have their own kind of agenda. They have their own organizational uh, proposals and everything but yeah at the same time they, we are aiming for the same goals but you can really yeah. kind of uh, really make some kind of control to do to their time to their political power and everything but essentially we able to connect or engage with them that's the kind of the thinking because when we change the supporters into collaborators it seems to be the same but we can really um, um, control what we are going to do 
uh, because they have their own rules and, and regulation and everything. So absolutely, we, yeah. Yeah. How, how can, can we do this? How can we? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great question. Um, it's something that we hear a lot from many different organizations. We cannot control our supporters. I think we can only attempt to understand them more and understand different levels of engagements. And we can seek to change their level of engagement with us or with other networks. So we use um, sort of a framework that I think is really useful to many organizations. It's called the engagement pyramid. Um, a lot of the exercises that Mob Lab does or uses, they're open source, uh, free for anyone to use. They're available on our website, uh, Mob Lab like campaign ingredients um, toolkit or um, the Commons, which is also another great sort of uh, repository of uh, frameworks and, and, and things to use. And so the engagement period pyramid just helps you think about the different levels of um, yeah, engagement of, of, of these people with your organization. And they can range from you know, observing to, to leading. And I think that speaks directly to how many opportunities um, a people-powered organization would provide to their network so that people can move from one level of engagement to another. And it's not, I, I don't want to say that we always want them to move up and up the pyramid. I, I don't think it's, you know, either positive or negative. People move up and down for all sorts of different reasons. Um, the biggest and most, the easiest way that you'll see that is in grassroots organizing. In grassroots organizing, everybody understands that everybody has different commitments and people move up and down this, this pyramid all the time. And you could just be in a phase of your life where you just had a kid. You could be in a phase of your life where you just had a breakup or you could be a phase in your life where you just made a lot of money from something, but then you quit your job and all of a sudden you have more time to work on something that you really care about and 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 these phases of our lives like last for you know a year five years six months it's really interesting so yeah these are these are some examples of of what all of our supporters can offer us and and all of the amazing resources that we can have if we know how to engage our networks and how to like present opportunities to them, right? So I really recommend checking out um, the engagement pyramid. Uh, it's it's super key. We we typically show it as part of our campaign accelerator. So this is it's just not in this training today. It's a more condensed, you know, format. Uh, but that would be a key way in in getting people involved in your campaign. And also maybe just using an engagement pyramid for your organization in general, um, you know, whether it's grassroots organizing or whether it's uh, an NGO or an INGO, I think we all need to really present invitations for people for them to engage with us because if we're not, if we're not, then we're losing some of these re resources, we're going to lose some expertise that we could have. We're definitely going to lose strength in numbers. We're gonna lose influence. And honestly, I would say we're going to lose credibility. You know, if, if people don't have the opportunity to be engaged. Yeah, Claire, do you have a question? Oh my gosh, I love everything you just said. Um, yeah, I was gonna add there too, maybe, and, and this maybe falls like just generally under influence, but one thing I was thinking, like one of our youth wanted to include something in the speech that we'd all co-written and it was moral authority like we were talking mm. we were addressing the premier and we were talking about intergenerational justice and how obviously inaction on climate disproportionately puts certain age groups like especially young people at risk people who don't have the right to vote often um mm -hmm. so anyways there's a school injustice about it and 
I just love this line. It was about how you have this moral authority on this issue. And Mm -hmm. I don't know what that did to me, but it was just, I was just floored. And I was like, that's like, that's, that's like what makes some of these stories so powerful. It's like, you know, if you're like a victim of like, you know, an extreme weather event, made more likely by climate change, if you're like the victim of like, just like flat out (laughs) intergenerational injustice or colonialism or whatever, like, you know, there are ways to like, have these people on board in the same mission and like elevating those people and then you know having influence even more influence that way anyways this is just I think you've already got it but I just I love that term I would put it on here too (laughs) yeah that's no you're right I I I really think that um credibility and moral authority are extremely important um they're they're not just resources. I think that they are key elements as well of successful campaigns. And I would just go a step further and and say that you know I love I love self led organizing and I love self led campaigns. Uh, we really think that people powered campaigns, the campaign design, should absolutely be informed and led by. Um, you know, self-led groups. So people who are directly experiencing, there's different, there's different terms for this now, kind of in the NGO field. It's always really interesting um, seeing how, you know, like social change is evolving and language is evolving. And sometimes like people just don't know how to express these things. But um, I say self-led, other people say lived experience. Um, they're, different because one is referring to advocacy and the other is referring to um, yeah just l- lived experience like people who are uh, who, people who are w- what you're talking about right and uh, both are powerful and they it, it just needs to be part of a campaign today I think unfortunately today 2022, this has turned into a little bit of a formula for companies. And so necessarily for companies, for NGOs, this has all turned into a formula for how to um, use people with lived experience and use them as as tokens or as, as I don't know, almost like, uh, <laughs> like the figure, the figure piece like the visual figure piece of a campaign or something. And if it's not, if this is not incorporated into the design, if these people don't have power or resources, um, you know, it's completely tokenistic. And I, I think that in the end, it there, I think in the end, people see through it. If they don't see through it in the beginning, by the end, it's it's a little bit more visible, you know. And I I've been a part of campaigns that have been completely tokenistic and maybe I didn't even realize in the beginning right but you figure out in the end because in the end there's no you you didn't you didn't build collective power in the end that's not what happened in the end it was just one organization you know trying to do with, with good intentions trying to do campaign and ultimately it was not people powered. Ultimately, it was not a systems change based campaign and you don't see any um, serious long-term change at the end of it because they didn't address power in, in a, they didn't address like power inequality. They didn't address um, the power that they hold relative to others. And we didn't build collective power through that campaigning process. So anyway, it's a great point that you raise. I think it's increasingly, increasingly important and people are becoming very intelligent about whether um, whether there is credibility and moral uh, authority there. So I think it's a great thing to notice. Um, these are just some examples of, you know, tactics to do with different supporters resources um there's there's just so many available tactics it's actually completely infinite so i don't want to i don't want us to think uh and just be restricted to these tactics here 
it's like the more that you think of tactics, the more that you can think of. Um, let's say, for example, this one I love. I love thinking about personal relationships. I think that when a lot of people are campaigning, they are a little bit hesitant to approach their personal relationships. They think that they have to speak into this void and somehow we have to reach strangers all the time. We have to somehow convert millions of strangers on the streets and uh, get them to give us money or to sign this or to like march with us. When in reality, the strongest relationships that we have are personal relationships. And it can feel a little bit uncomfortable, like, approaching your friends or and family but these are some of the mo the most powerful stories that i've heard um yeah so these are some tactics to think about um affecting your relationships and sort of getting them you know to participate in your campaign and to contribute in all of these other ways that are possible um i've invited friends to for example if there's like a uh, a regional, an Asian association of migrant domestic workers in Hong Kong. And I want to influence my friends and family. I want them to understand what these activist domestic migrant workers in Hong Kong are doing. They just don't know them. So I bring them to a dinner that they organize. And this association, you know, does a few speeches and has a few dances and we're all eating together. And I actually find at the end of the dinner, that my friends and family are very touched. I mean, they had no idea of all this amazing advocacy that was happening in Hong Kong uh, by a group of people that is just basically invisible to them on a daily basis, and also in the media here, and also in media everywhere around the world. So these are these are just some examples of tactics. Claire, did you have a, did you have a something else or other? Your hand is raised. Oh, no? Oh, sorry. No, nope, that's not Just okay. to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and just to say that there are just so many tactics. I want to say also for opinion uh, voice that uh, not included in the tactics is, you know, not just letters to the editor, but writing, writing in the media. So um, if you're a journalist, if you have connections to journalists, or if you have connections to editors, then pitching something and writing something yourself. And um, this is something that I particularly work in as like I work in media strategy and I've worked with different feminist organizations and uh, we, we just need a really multi-pronged media strategy these days. It can't just be social media. We really need to be entering public conversations, engaging with, the media, and there's many diverse ways of doing that. So yeah, all of the tactics are completely endless. Um, it's about having, it's about knowing what resources you have, and then just being as creative as possible with your tactics. Once you have your goals and objectives, and you know what resources you have, right? Um, yeah, so this is just to go through an example. Um, are you, you both are familiar with a just transition? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, we're, just transition is still like an ongoing campaign. This has really not ended. We are still campaigning for this to happen and for I think for for everyone to know what a, tr a just transition is as well I find that um, many it's it's in some ways still a little bit of like a marginalized topic like it sounds a little bit radical to a lot of people most of the uh, you know climate justice environmental justice campaigns that I've seen, they've been based on this like negative force campaign goal that I talked about. So it's typically to um, cut emissions, to cut, to, you know, ban fossil fuels, to tax this, to, 
there is a negative action that is the campaign goal because in general we want to reduce um yeah we just want we just want to reduce it seems very it seems like very difficult to stop using fossil fuels in general uh, a just transition is a really interesting campaign goal because it is a it is what i call a positive force campaign goal there is a campaign goal that is um it's it's almost like uh, also like a rebranded uh you know negative force campaign equal as there's a way to say if you say just transition then it just seems like the creation of so many things but it's also asking there's also some negative asks in it you know but just calling it just giving it a name just um saying that this is what we want this is the future this is the roadmap um for what we want it's really interesting as a campaign idea i mean i really like it and um i think there's a lot of strong storytelling aspects strong like narrative aspects of just transition as a campaign idea um so it, it was just a great um, it's a great example that I like to use. I think there's still a lot to do around, for example, I don't see, I don't see um, a lot of coverage around a just transition. I see this mentioned more in uh, NGO circles. I don't see it in mainstream media as much. I don't, I don't see that everyone I know, like most people that I know don't know what it is. So it seems like there's still um, an informational gap. I think it's a very strong um, narrative, strong story, strong image, but that the message hasn't been disseminated enough. Or it hasn't like, uh, it's not a public discussion yet. And it's really interesting because what a lot of people powered systems change campaigning is is just to in, in my opinion i think it is to build collective power and to push these narratives and these shifts that just seem unimaginable it has to seem unimaginable to us and it takes years and years and years to do it you know and i i wanted to refer to strike debt again because i think that they exist since you know, 2012 or so, and um, basically just now, you know, for the first time, the US government announced that they would, you know, relieve some student debt. And this is a little bit unimaginable to most Americans in the US. And uh, I think it was, you know, it took them 10 years. And that's something that can be entirely plausible as well. Obviously, we don't have 10 years when it comes to a just transition. But the point is that it's a collective effort and that really when, I think when campaigns break into public domain and become a talk, a mainstream talking point, that that's another way that they've succeeded in some ways. You know, and this is what had this is what has happened to abortion rights in Latin America. This is what has happened to um, student debt in the U.S. They broke into the mainstream consciousness thanks to grassroots organizers, thanks to people-powered organizations, and and um, you know, uh, community collectives and, and just networks of you know social change like activists and organizations. But it took it took a while. Um, so just looking at some other like people powered tactics, um, people powered approaches to campaigning, like how to create invitations for people to participate in different ways. Um, there's really going to be, like I said, like so many more. Uh, so many more options than just this. It's just kind of like, I think we know a lot of these tactics, but when you write them down, you, you realize how many more there are. And for any, you know, for any of these approaches that we're going to be 
that we're going to be talking about. Um, for this one, I think, and a lot of them sort of overlap. For example, I think of, um, you know, donating, volunteering, organizing, raising awareness. It's, it's really interesting, but like some tactics can cross over all of these. Um, I'm also a DJ and I do parties. And in some ways I combine my DJing and like my organizing backgrounds and I do like um, mutual aid parties. So we, you know, put on music, sell tickets, have a great time. And we're talking about, you know, grassroots groups that are self-led and um, doing amazing work. And they're there as well. And they talk about their work and they talk about the issues that they work on. And we raise money and everybody has a great time. And it's sort of like, there are volunteers, we'll always ask for volunteers. People are always donating much more than, um, you know, the ticket entry. They're donating in other ways. They donate like in-kind goods. They donate their time. They are donating money beyond the tickets. Um, they're donating food. Um, we're organizing, we're organizing like different um, groups together. Uh, we're raising aware, we're storytelling in that night. We're storytelling through music. We're story, we're like sharing content on our Instagram about these parties, about these issues. We're talking about, you know, the money we raised and being very transparent about it. There's just so many, yeah. I would just encourage people to be as creative as possible with, the tactics that they're using and to always search for ways to involve people in any of these, in any of these approaches. Um, thinking about how to involve people and thinking about how to manage people and thinking about how to organize with other people is probably the most important and most like you know, life-changing thing that we can do in, in our organizing. It's all about people. It's all about the relationships that we have, that we build, that we make along the way. Um, so I, I think it's the most rewarding thing as well about campaigning. Uh, it's another aspect for me, but I also think about um, what it's like for different types of people. Like I'm a very extroverted person. There is a lot of things that I'm going to do that's in going to be about like face-to-face -face communication or uh, writing or, you know, talking or just, just introducing people. And I, I always think about what it's like for people who are more um, shy, more introverted. What are, what are like, uh, what are ways to engage them? What are ways that they can help? And very often there's lots of shy and introverted people who are very like interested in in organizing and volunteering in some way they just don't want to do that they just don't want to like talk to other people face to face uh, but there's so many ways to involve them and and to um you know to to enjoy also like their expertise their talents their unique their unique skills in organizing so i do recognize that we have like a very we have a society that really rewards like extroverted vocally communic communicating people. So I just think it's important to point out that we want to be finding roles and finding places for all, all different sorts of people, people who are comfortable doing different things and just making sure that people feel comfortable and included, I think is the most important thing. Yeah. Do you, Tony and Claire, like, do you have any sort of examples of, you know, people power tactics that you really like that are that are not mentioned here, or anything you want to share? Feel free. Otherwise, we can move on. I think this is quite quite um, like a complete uh, or details of a kind of a option that we have, There's but a of lot. course, there are some kind of a level of. Um, interactivity or act, we we in t 50 we used to say that or the onion of engagement maybe because of those the, because uh, yeah, yeah, every, the layers. everything you need yeah. to have those kind of things maybe like a low hanging fruit like sign up petition in the end we can mobilize people but there are some kind of a degree that we can 
uh, engage with people so that we able to mobilize more people to join. So yeah, this is interesting. This is com I think this is quite complete kind of ideas of, of what we have. It's a little bit like a tactic vomit here. So just think of it in that way. Like it's just for it's just to show people all of the different examples. Claire, do you have yeah, you know, do you have any like tactics that you like the most or anything you wanted to share? Um first I'll be the slightest Debbie Downer and say I might have to go at nine, or for me it's nine, so in 30 minutes. Um mm -hmm. but I do have to finish something by midnight. But um, mm -hmm. I, by the way, like I'm and another side note that I love this sort of like intimate presentation. I'm so grateful. <laughs> like, please add me. It's just on for my you. <laughs> yeah, I feel so lucky. Seriously. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at this and I'm like, it's true. It's complete. Um, it's, it's interesting. I've never really thought about fundraising as like an example of people power, but it's well, I feel like I've wanted to believe that, but I've you know, sometimes people say they're so different, but yeah, I just, I'm, I'm happy to see that there. And cause it's true. It's like, it's its own sort of form of like asking someone to sort of, um, do something difficult, like invest part of themselves, like part of their like labor and time basically, um, into. So, um, yeah. And yeah, I love this idea of like sort of social proof. I know that like this is boring. I don't, you guys can stop me if this is boring, but just just a slight observation is like uh, sometimes I struggle with like, like the concept of like systems change um, mm. because I kind mm. of started out as someone who like took a lot of individual action and like wanted to be like a role, you know to do what was right and stuff, and then I viewed like you know that's how things change and like just an example of like mm -hmm. just to alienate everyone on the call right away. I'm I like was like a <laughs> vegan um at like 18 and I still am and mm -hmm. like that sort of was like my initial introduction to everything and like that's sort mm -hmm. of how I thought about changing things you just stay consistent you know know your argument or whatever if someone wants to talk to you about it <laughs> and then like mm -hmm. you know things progress and and, and it, indeed it, things have in that in that particular um area but so yeah, I, I, I think I've like for a long time thought of like behavior change as like the thing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm also just, I think Greenpeace for instance has like gone, at least Greenpeace Canada has gone like, um, you know, very far away from like sort of focusing on behavior change, um, mm -hmm. which I think is positive because there's like, you know, groups as big as Greenpeace, like they need to sort of put, we need to sort of put our money and our power, you know, and start, start <laughs> fight, fighting like the bigger players, I guess. Um, yeah. If you will. So I don't know, like I'm always, anyways, this might just be like a, just, you know, pontificating or whatever on this, like maybe a distinction without a difference, but like, I don't know. I'm just, I always find myself being like, you know, can we do both? Like, do we have to choose one or the other? Like, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so this is, anyways, this is me thinking out loud. Yeah. So you can just go on. This is great. No, it's interesting. Um, I, I definitely, there are a lot of organizations, not all, but there are a lot that like Greenpeace have moved away from sort of talking about you know environmental or climate justice through the lens of like individual behavior change um, and began to focus more on systems change but I also understand what you say like the initial first step for you in your own journey is as an individual like I completely understand this um, I think when we talk about system change, what we're really talking about, like, is this is this is an this is an opportunity for a coalition or a group of or or an organization, hopefully an organization in network designing a campaign with lots of different actors and, and having access to like feedback and stuff. Um, this is an opportunity for them to 
really design a campaign that tackles systems change. So a campaign that is basically going to shift power. Um, as an individual beginning to, you know, get politicized on beginning to understand yourself and your values and what you're interested in and what you're going to, you know, get involved in. I think it would be quite tough for you to think about systems change already from that perspective. You know, maybe young people today are getting politicized at a, you know, faster rate and have more access to information and are beginning are thinking about systems change like very early on in their political journey. For other people, it's if we just have different timelines, you know, I of course we're thinking about things through our own individual lens first. So when we do when we do campaign design workshops for like um, people powered systems change campaigns, these are for activists and organizations that like quite an advanced phase of their you know campaigning lifetime. They want to like deepen their their approach to campaigns because ultimately, if we don't build collective power if we don't change the ecosystem of actors and players and stuff, we're kind of like just running around in circles. We're not, um, our campaigns are not going to be effective, essentially, if we don't approach them from a systems change lens. Yeah, but I, I appreciate what you said, because I think it's just, it's just something that's true. Like we have to, um, There is an individual aspect to participation as well, as well as a collective aspect. And I think that's why, that's why here the, I think, you know, just some examples of behavior change, just, you know, spreading the word, people just telling each other about um, a campaign or inviting them to something is an example. I, I've always thought that word of mouth is also like, it's a little bit like it's the oldest form of credibility and moral authority as well. If people really, you know, believe in something and they share it with each other, it means more to other people to hear it from another person. It means more to hear it from them than from the internet and from the media and from the government. Um, so it's, that's that's quite an individual aspect, I think, to getting involved and to participating in some ways. Yeah, yeah part of the last thing I'll add about that, like part of me thinks that um, like it also depends on like where society is like as a whole. Like if I'm like mm -hmm. trying to, let's say like get banks to divest from fossil fuels like 40 years ago, <laughs> like rather than like convincing like, I just feel like, I don't know, maybe I'm just assuming things about like back, you know, even 40 years ago, but my sense is that like, there just weren't enough. It just wasn't, I think you said the words. Like it wasn't campaign, as much of a well-known issue. It didn't issue. break into the, it, it would have been mm -hmm. harder to like, as you said before, like break into the public domain without mm -hmm. sort of like conver convincing individuals and converting them first. Um, yeah. So I don't know, like, I think there's like, part of me is trying to be charitable to myself and other people too, and say, you know, it's also maybe a different strategy for like different, you know, times yeah. or like, I understand, you know, I understand what you're saying. I think, I think that you can, it's because we're not getting into our systems change um, ex exercises in this workshop. So it's like a little bit hard to illustrate. But I think you can think about it like this, like a campaign strategy that includes um, a vision of systems change can also feature opportunities to engage individuals. You can have a vision for systems change. You can map out um, your system. You can understand the actors and the players. You can want to change um, relationships in that system, but you can have concrete 
uh, asks and invitations for participation and engagement for individuals at every level, at every level of an engagement pyramid. It all depends on your campaign, you know, goal objectives, and then you can design the tactics accordingly. I completely agree with you. It is it is so different to design a campaign. Let's say like, um, let's say, let's say like a just transition now, it would be like asking banks to divest from fossil fuels like 40 years ago. I think now everyone is divesting from fossil fuels. You have to do it, but right now we're kind of in this moment of people doing like the least amount of uh, reforms that they can like the least amount of cuts that they can and we're not something like really committing to a just transition like it seems really unimaginable in my opinion this is my, like my current reading um i still yeah I, I still i just think it's a problem if people don't know what it is like maybe 40 years ago, maybe people didn't know what divestment was, you know, maybe they don't know, like, oh, they didn't know that banks have money and they, they don't have, they don't know how banks work. They don't know that banks like are making money off of their money. Um, then they don't know that they're making money off of their money in like very, uh, in ways that are harming our planet, that are harming people, that are harming supply chains. Um, so if, if people don't know what it is, then they also can't care about it. And then they have to know what it is. And then they also have to care about it. And then we have to create a whole campaign around that. It's like, it's like what you say, you have to build, um, it starts, you know, it starts from like one person to one person in the beginning, right? So if we were going to design a new campaign for the just transition in a very specific context, let's say, okay, I'll give a really unimaginable context because this is where I live. Um, if somebody were to start a campaign for a just transition in, in Hong Kong, this would be unimaginable to me. I mean, this is like Hong Kong and China do not care about the climate crisis. Maybe this is the first year that China has like ever realized that there is a climate crisis. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, Hong Kong is like swimming in lots of problems, uh, environmentally, politically. So I, I personally can't imagine it uh, here. And um, in the beginning, there would have to be some aspects of the campaign design that is designed around like, small entry points, people really using their personal relationships, building a campaign design, building a campaign goal and objectives, but using tactics that are really appropriate to the phase that we're in, in the context that we're in, um, and really building, I think the, I think working on the, you know, personal relationships, this is a core strategy of community organizing. You know, campaigners are ult ultimately should be community organizers, and this is always going to be my, you know, line. Uh, we owe a lot to community organizers for every large scale campaign success that we've had. This is built off of the backs of community organizers. We all need to be community organizers, um, and we we all need to achieve, you know, success at scale as well. Right. But the fundamentals of community organizing is that this is your community. Like you are part of your community. They depend on you. You depend on them. You need to you need to nurture these relationships and they trust you more because this is your community. This is where you have the most impact. This is where you have the most influence. This is where you have the most credibility, moral authority. There is a lot of impact, there is a lot of opportunity for individuals um, to, you know, to act, to get involved, to spread, to, to convey information, to, you know, yeah, to just invite people around them into these issues. And then, you know, there are tactics for other strategies and, and, 
and it's sort of like things can things can scale up. Um, but I, I I don't believe that we need to be doing you know uh, global campaigns all the time. I think that it's highly dependent and it depends on every uh, group of concerned citizens assessing what they want to do, where they want to do it. There was a really great report by a UK foundation. I have to find the name again, but they did um, a really, really great landscape analysis of uh, campaigning in the UK context over the past decade. Um, and yeah, they, they found that most of the, um, yeah, most of the most successful campaigns that they found were at the municipal level. Um, so, you know, really embedded groups working on very clear defined, maybe not always systems change campaigns, but, you know, campaigns with very clear objectives, clear goals, and um, they are obviously building power at a, you know, on a, at a city level. And they were able to change a lot of these laws and legislation. Um, and it's just an interesting report because they talk about specifically like all of the obstacles that campaigners face today in the UK context. Some of this is also preventing successes at you know, a national level, um, at an international level. So it's, it's kind of good to assess this and where we are today. There's just so many new obstacles against campaign. There's like, and we can't protest in so many countries and cities around the world now, can't be on the streets. Um, lots of new sort of like authoritarianisms everywhere. So what can you do where we are? You know, I think that's the eternal campaigning question. Okay, so we have about like, you know, 15 minutes left. So I'll run through the rest of the presentation really quickly. <laughs> um, this is amazing. Yeah, and for the last part, we're just gonna focus on storytelling, um, one of my favorite aspects of building out a campaign. I think it should be, you know, key to the campaign strategy after doing the, the kind of basic building blocks goals, objectives, um, strategies, tactics. If you don't have a campaign story, you know, maybe hold back on launching your campaign until you find a campaign story. Um, yeah, this is, um, I guess I should just briefly introduce storytelling as well. I mean, I think, we say storytelling a lot in NGO spheres, um, but really it's just something that everyone does. Um, if you're, for example, at a dinner party and you wanna talk to a group of people, you wouldn't talk to them like you're talking to your friend, but like uh, your individual experiences back and forth. You tell a story to the whole group if you wanna share something that happened with them. And I'm always noticing the way that people are telling stories in these kind of group situations. They kind of um, emphasize some aspects. They allow people to ask questions at some moments. They do a dramatic pause, or I notice that they're talking too much. Or, um, I notice something in the story doesn't quite add up. So this is a way that we're, we're working together basically as a human species and it evolved to, you know, we evolved this habit out of survival instincts. Um, the whole point of a story is to convey meaning and not just the facts. So you really want to be thinking about, um, for lack of better words, the moral of the story. What is the point of this story? Not just the facts like A plus B equals C, but what is the reason why you're telling this story and how is it related to what you wanna say? Like, for example, I told the story about telling stories at dinner parties because I wanted to talk about how important storytelling is. So that's the, that's the reason why I told that story. Um, 
what does it give meaning to our societies? It's actually, you can, I think we should be thinking about all of the harmful stories as well as all of the positive stories. Stories are also um, myths. Uh, sometimes they're just plain unfactually, you know, they're just unfactual, they're not true. And a lot of stories and a lot of myths are harmful and they also create the basis for all of the, you know, injustice that we see today, all the inequality that we see today, and also a lot of nationalism is based off of false stories, uh, fake history, things that didn't happen, uh, patriotism, very masculine uh, sort of nation founding story, but it gives people identity and that's, that's how we are where we are. So I think a lot of what we should be doing as campaigners is trying to identify harmful stories and addressing them. I, I don't think that we can pretend that these stories don't exist. I don't think that we can ignore them because they give so much to people. They create their identities. They are how we communicate to each other. As campaigners, we need to actively be identifying harmful stories and actively creating new stories based on human rights, based on facts, based on um, things that would be for our collective well-being. We need to tell better stories than our opposition, basically. And it's also especially because um, it's going to be stories that motivate people to act. I think if you don't tell them a better story than the one that they've heard, they people are not going to want to change anything. Um, a lot of campaigners, unfortunately, are only engaging people who are already interested and already slightly informed of the issues to act. Um, I think when we move from mobilizing to that, that's what that is, mobilizing is, you know, uh, mobilizing people who already share our values and who um, already believe in the same things that we do. I think when we go from mobilizing to organizing, and organizing is, you know, organizing massive amounts of people who did not formally share these values, were not formally engaged with us, are not in our networks. I think that's, you know, that that's that's the really like people powered approach um, is to motivate, you know, these people to act and to get them in community with us. Um, so I really take this organizing approach. Yeah, it's a storytelling. You need to have an act. Um, kind of shared a lot of this already, but I think ultimately um, the last part is super important. We need to ultimately show that another world is possible and how people can be a part of building it. This is also why I'm encouraging people to develop campaigns that don't have these negative force action goals because inherently you're going to be able to show people that another world is possible and how they can be part of building it. If your campaign goal is that, you say, well, this is how and this is, this is how and why another world is possible because this is our campaign goal. We wanna build this infrastructure. We wanna fund this project. We want to um, get, we want to have, let's say like, we wanna have a participatory budgeting for our municipal government. We want to have clean water by 2030 available for everybody in our city. So instead of, you know, it's, we can design our campaigns in a way in which this message, this story can inherently be shown just by showing people the goals and objectives. While at the same time, I don't villainize the negative force, um, you know, campaign goals. I understand that they're necessary and this is just, this is part of the moment that we're in, you know, but it's, it's another thing to think about. So storytelling and communication is oh, a little bit also about um, the packaging. I think we're not gonna have time to watch this. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide. 
Um, this is where, you know, communication strategy comes in. Um, I think that you can't have just people who are responsible for communications in a, in a campaign design process. Everybody needs to be responsible for communications. Storytelling is so key to the campaign that if everybody who is not involved is not able to tell the story of the campaign, then you know, you're not ready yet because we, we're all communicators. We're all, con we're all in network with different people. We all need to be able to tell this story. And sometimes I like to, I, sometimes I like to do this exercise where um, I like to go around like on a team meeting in a, in a Zoom, let's say, like we're at a team meeting, let's say just of my organization. And I like to ask everybody, I was like, um, so, you know, describe, describe the work that we do in one or two sentences. And you'll see everybody says something different because it's kind of weird to say the organizational mission, like word for word. It's also strange because why did you memorize it? You know, you should be able to say in your own words what it is that you do and what it is that you believe. And in your own words, it's so much more powerful anyway. And you'll see that from what people say, they have a different, they um, personally relate to some aspects more than others. And it'll be like this for everybody who's involved um, with the campaign. They will relate to some aspects more than others and they'll emphasize it more in the way that they talk about the campaign. But these are all good things to note when you're telling the campaign story is, um, you know, targeting emotions, um, asking asking people to act in some way, um, reaching different target groups. Um, and then for some of these things, there are some like very concrete resources that can help, you know, more than this slide. It's, there is a lot of resources and toolkits on how to frame issues in a, on a hope-based way, in a positive way, in very proactive ways, and how to frame also like resources and how to frame issues in ways that are not harmful. Because in some, in some cases, some campaigners have the best intentions, but they're ultimate, some, they're using some campaign materials that might be promoting some harmful narratives without them knowing. So there's lots of toolkits on like how to frame, uh, let's say for example, abortion rights, you know, how to frame LGBTQ rights. There's, there's ways that we can be, um, you know, using visual material or using some language that without us even knowing is, is still perpetuating like some you know, harmful stereotypes. So there's framing is really important and thinking about framing um, you know, hope versus fear, hope versus anger, hope versus you know, a lot of negative emotions. Um, and I, I, I would say because, you know, I'm, I'm so focused on this like hope-based narrative, this is really important for me, you know, magnifying the negative aspect loudly, but not too loudly, showing the alternatives. What is it that we want besides just the negative, right? Um, thinking about there's this huge push for like solutions-based journalism. What about from, what about from social justice organizations? Where is the huge push for like solutions-based social justice? I would say that sometimes it's quite hard for us to find because like it, this has to be a collective effort. So some organizations will not be able to propose the solutions that we need, but we need to be, you know, in contact with each other and constantly collaborating. And a lot of the best solutions resources that I've seen have come from collaborations between different NGOs and foundations and think tanks and the like. Um, for example, I'll give a good example of a communications resource that is in of itself a campaign. So it's called uh, Broke, the Broke Project. 
and it is uh, it's a website and there's a video and resources and research and uh, a framing toolkit. And it is a new sort of campaign and communications resource to change the way that we're talking about poverty and wealth in the US. The framing of poverty and wealth is that it is inevitable. Um, poor people deserve to be poor. Rich people deserve to be rich. And this is a campaign to change that, to change the way that we're talking about poor people and it's like broke, because broke is kind of slang to refer to people who are poor, right? It's really interesting. It's completely targeting um, narratives and it is a great campaign. And it's the result of like a collaboration across like four different organizations. It's not necessarily a people powered campaign, otherwise there would be lots of ways for all of us to you know, participate and, and, and um, act in some way. It's really targeting communicators like journalists, academics, um, you know, but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a people powered campaign, but it, it is an aspect of you know, framing and utilizing solutions and you know, they're also reaching their target audiences. I think these are just some basic storytelling um, principles that you can really incorporate into your campaign. We want to make these stories um, personal and relatable, a lot like with what Tony mentioned from you know, their favorite campaigns is that they have to be, this is another way in which like individuals can play a strong role, Claire, um, in informing campaigns. We have to be, in a while, while we're talking about collective and systemic issues, they have to be individual and relatable to some aspect. And I'll give an example. The best articles that I've read by journalists are talking about systemic issues, but they open by telling a human story in the first paragraph. They tell a story about an individual and what they went through and that immediately pulls us in. And then they, weave different stories so that it's not just about the individual. They share research and facts. They relate individual stories to system systemic injustice. And this is what we have to do. It's so hard to do. It's so much easier to just be individualizing and you know use poverty porn and 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 all of these things. So uh, go ahead, Claire. Yeah, I'll just say like, I write a lot of our fundraising emails um, and by like, not only is it generally like best practice, but it's like, it's proven like by our data and our, you know, our numbers that to work like, you know, sort of like zooming in on a problem and like the individual impact, like the, the cost to individuals of the problem and then zooming out and saying, this is requiring macro solutions and this is what can be done. So like, I often, I find myself too thinking, and it's true, like these are the best, these are, these are some of the best like storytelling strategies, like for like impactful messages um, like to, to get those across. Um, That's so great. And like, they're just yeah. um, close by, like not in some other part of the world, they're here. <laughs> yeah. Zooming in and zooming out is great. I think if you do one but not the other, it doesn't it doesn't work or it's not as good. Like if you just tell the individual story, unfortunately, this does not help people to understand how systemic injustice works. Then they think it's just an individual anomaly or some kind of naturalized uh, individual fault. It's, you know, it can be very harmful actually to just share individual stories. So it's great to share about zooming in and zooming out. Um, yeah, I, it, it is nine on the dot. And so I am happy to end the training here, especially because I know that you have to go clear. Um, and that we had a little bit less time than I would have liked today, but I think I think I I'm happy with everything that I I've shared from my side. I've really tried to just share these like five principles of 
campaign strategy from you know from what we can at mob lab and there's so many more resources on systems change um, and so many exercises that are open source and free on our website and on other um, sort of campaigning exercise websites and yeah if you have any questions please let me know claire um this was amazing i'm so grateful that i was like after dinner i was like i'm gonna go attend that call i think i'm gonna do it <laughs> and i'm so glad i did because damn what a what a what a gift like anyways so, you know personal attention and all that stuff so um this Aww, is great. yay <laughs> yeah i'm just i'm so glad and fantastic presentation like your colleague said complete like there was nothing really that any of us could add <laughs> um mm -hmm. yeah it was great i'm gonna i've taken screenshots i know that you um you already said that um the slides would be made available i'll get those too um, mm -hmm. but yeah this is gonna even help me with my the thing i have to do tonight so oh that's amazing. great <laughs> that's great to hear yeah. yeah thank you so much for joining yeah thanks Tony, on as LinkedIn. Well. Mm -hmm. add me on